Hello, everybody, and welcome to a special edition of Hawkblogger Mornings. This is Brian Nemhauser. You can find me on Twitter at Hawkblogger. And there's only one guy who is worthy of changing all schedules to make sure we can get him on the show and have a conversation about what is one of the most important positions for the Seattle Seahawks in this upcoming draft and also maybe one of the deepest. And that is interior offensive line and offensive line in general. That guy is Brandon Thorne. Uh, he is one of, if not the best, uh, trench prospect evaluators focusing on offensive linemen. And he joins us while on the road uh, making time for us. So, Brandon, welcome to the show, and, and thanks for making the time, man. Yeah, I'm happy to do this. Thanks for being flexible and you know, kind of accommodating uh, what I got going on. So I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I respect all the work you put in. For folks that aren't familiar with your work, uh, give us a quick beat on how you got into this and where your content shows up on things like Establish the Run and other places like that. Yeah, so I got into it um, close to 10 years ago now. Um, just kind of a guy who I was in the military for 10 years or so and uh, always a huge football fan and you know, kind of did my own like mock draft, big board type thing, you know, while I was in and uh, wanted to try to break into scouting, you know, in the NFL. That was kind of a, a big goal of mine. So I left the military and, you know, joined Twitter. Uh, you know, it's like 2013, 14 when I really got like active on it at least. And, uh, you know, just started reaching out to people and um, trying to find ways to kind of, you know, make myself more knowledgeable. You know, and I uh, ran into the Scouting Academy, uh, which is an online based kind of scouting curriculum taught by former NFL scouts and coaches. And, and that was kind of one of my first steps in the process of kind of, you know, getting my own process for uh, for scouting and how to articulate what you see and put it on paper and to avoid buzzwords and be precise and, you know, things like that. And so that's what that helped me with. And also establishing connections and I got a job scouting for the senior bowl through them. Uh, so I scouted for the senior bowl for a few years, um, uh, back when Phil Savage was running it and, uh, met former general manager of the Broncos named Ted, Sun Ted Sunquist, who was an air force veteran like me living mm -hmm. in Colorado, like me. And, uh, we got connected and man, he, he opened a lot of doors and, you know, just kept building on itself. And I, you know, was a big offensive line fan and played it in high school and saw on Twitter nobody was really talking about it. And if they were, you know, it really didn't really like go in depth at all. So I figured I'm just going to kind of focus on this, you know, and uh, met LaCharles Bentley, Duke Mannyweather, a bunch of guys, you know, right when they were starting out. And, uh, you know, it's just built over the years, man. And now, you know, I've been doing it full time for a few years now, and it's just a huge blessing. And, just been very thankful and I really enjoy it. Amazing. Amazing. Well, I, I certainly have appreciated your work and, and your breakdowns and let's get right into it. Cause I know we've yep. got a lot of guys to talk about. Um, as we get into that, I guess I'd ask you, do you agree with the characterization I started with? And we welcome disagreement on this show, so don't feel like you got to. But do you feel like interior offensive line is a good position in this draft? Um, is it a good position uh, relative to just other positions in this draft? Is it a good position relative to other drafts um, for interior offensive line? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, depending on how you're projecting some of these college tackles, uh, you know, if, if you do see them as interior players, which I would say I see probably more than most as best cased in interior sort of pro players. Um, so with that being said, under that circumstance, I think that it's an excellent uh, interior offensive line class uh, center in particular, I think is very deep. Um, and then with a bunch of these guys who I think would be best inside, uh, like, you know, uh, Taliese Fuaga, Jordan Morgan, um, a few other guys that I project best inside, Troy Fatanu, um, then, then yeah, this guard class is also really good too. So, yeah, I mean, you, you can find a starter in the first few rounds, I think, for sure. 
Good to hear. And let's let's start there. Let's start Seahawks pick at number 16. And there's potentially some guys available there. And then there's potential the Seahawks are also have not do not have a second round pick, but may try to trade back and, and get into the later half of the first round and then maybe pick up a second round pick. Before we start talking about projections for Seattle in particular, of the guys that could be tackles that you project could play guard like Fautanu, like Fuaga, um, or centers that could also potentially play guard if you think of Jackson Powers Johnson or Graham Barton, depending on how you see those guys, but all those guys combined. Um, how many guys do you believe have true like blue chip level, like maybe pro bowl or even all pro level upside? I would say there's maybe five or so, uh, five or six. Um, I, I think I'm, I don't have my, my list in front of me, um, but I would say, uh, you're in specifically, are you talking about overall or, or interior only? Let's focus on guard. I mean, if they have yeah. tackle ability, that's great, but I think guard is the primary area of need for the Seahawks. And so we're interested right. in guys that could be standout guards. Yeah. Pro bowl caliber guard only sort of guys i would say maybe three or four you know at the most um i would say fatanu is number one he's my top guard in the draft so uh, i think he would be outstanding you know for seattle you know at left guard say i mean i think that you could have pretty much a, a blue chip type of left guard within the first couple of years and him i think even though he's only played i think i think he only has two starts there um, I just think his skill set projects very well there. So he's my top guard in the draft. And uh, after that, then, you know, you're getting into probably my second guard right now is Graham Bart from Duke. Uh, you know, another likely going to play inside, could also play center, um, but I would prefer him to get a chance at guard. He would be my number two guard uh, in the class. And then number three, I believe I have uh, Taliese Fawaga as my number three guard. Um, and those three guys I could see being Pro Bowl caliber type of guards. Uh, maybe Jackson Powers Johnson, if you project him at guard, you know, he, he could play guard, I think, for sure. Um, he's he's more so my top center, but he, he could play guard as well. So those four really stand out to me more than anybody else with that sort of upside at guard. That's great. To, that's great. And familiar names. How do you separate out someone like Fautanu from Graham Barton? Yeah, I mean, I just think he's a little bit more powerful. And, uh, you know, that's that's really w what it is. I mean, Barton is very I mean, he, he you know he delivers some pop and some jolt at the point of attack, but he's more so a play strength guy where he can you know, overcome force with force and really strain and grind guys down and very sticky, kind of a stubborn, sticky run blocker I have in my scouting report. I think that's probably the best way to describe him. He's very difficult to shed off. Um, and part of that is due to how athletic he is as well. He can just, his body control is very good. He can, he can sustain blocks at a high level. Um, and he brings some power, you know, but Fatanu to me is just, just a little bit a step above in terms of the sudden impact that he can deliver on guys to knock them off their feet, you know, knock them on their heels. I mean, you know, more so than knock them off their feet, unless it's a second level guy, which he's tremendous at. Um, but yeah, just, just a little bit more square power. I would say that Patanu offers um, a little bit more of a physically imposing kind of guy. And I think that that's what separates those guys. Is there a guy there's, there's, there's this kind of a collection of guys that, are maybe in the next set or it depends on where you see them, but these could be second round picks, third round picks, fourth round picks. I'm curious if any of these guys are favorites of yours or guys that you think could develop into, you know, high level starters, maybe not pro bowl, but, but high level starters. And I'll give you a few names. Uh, there's Christian Haynes, there's Zach Sinter, Cooper BB, Christian Mahogany, Mason McCormick and Dominic Puny. A any of those guys for you jump, jump out. I would say my top three rated guys of, of those names are Haynes, Pooney, and Mahogany. So th those are the three that stand out to me most. Um, and all kind of very different players as well. You know, Pooney is a college left tackle, former real small school guy who transferred to Kansas. 
uh, in recent years and um, played left tackle last year and at the senior bowl repped at guard and center and uh, it was really good to see him at those spots because especially center I thought he looked really good in in a mobile um, so he, he has a lot of positional versatility more so than Haynes and Mahogany do um, so that's where his appeal comes but he's a bigger physically imposing sort of guy with good body control uh, and that's really what stands out most on his film um, I think he could be a, a good player and uh, and then Haynes is kind of a right guard only kind of guy who repped at left guard a little bit at the senior bowl but I think all 40 plus of his starts at UConn were at right guard only so really not a lot of positional versatility he also got some reps at center um, in Mobile but I think he's probably a guy ideally you just keep a right guard kind of in the mold of uh, Kevin Dotson coming out of uh, Louisiana Lafayette a few years back when he was a right guard only we still you got you Brandon or did we lose you There we go. All right. Sorry. Not sure if we, we lost you there for a second. So um, a name that you did not call in there that's been of interest for Seahawks fans is Zach Zinter uh, coming off an injury. What, what kind of player do you see him as uh, once he gets recovered from his injury? Yeah, he's a guy I actually still need to finish my scouting report on, but I've, I've seen several games of him and I have an initial grade on him. I, I see more with him as a, a solid, kind of capable, functional starter, whatever you know, kind of synonym you want to throw out there, a guy who, who could be fine. You know, I, I don't see anything that he does that is going to move the needle necessarily. He's, he's kind of solid, you know, the adequate, it, it, pretty much everything. You know, he kind of reminds me of, of Andrew Voorhees coming out last year, uh, not just because they both got hurt, uh, see more he's played this year for Baltimore um, but you know kind of that that kind of player I see him more as a functional kind of player who you know could, could fill a role and you know not, not somebody you're necessarily going to build an offensive line around or anything or count as like a high-end starter that's, that's kind of my impressions of him right now all right last couple of questions I've got for you Brandon um, who's joining us Brandon Thorne uh, trench warfare established the run on, on the the phone with us here Anthony Bradford was a player that the Seahawks drafted last year in the fourth round as a guard he played started at guard for them a, a fair amount at uh, right guard last year uh, if you had a chance to scout him last year do you have a feeling of like where would he rank um, you know which of these guys would be around the same caliber of what, of what you think of as Anthony Bradford as a guard? Yeah, so every year for my sub stack on Trench Warfare, I do uh, my top 10, like, quote unquote, my guys in the draft. And I pick, you know, a couple day one guys, a couple day two guys, a couple day three guys, you know, a few of each. And uh, Anthony Bradford was one of those 10 last year. So. I did an in-depth writing on, I mean, I've scouted every offensive lineman in the draft with scouting reports on Bleacher Report over the last four years. So if anybody's curious, they can just Google my name with whatever player they want over the last four years and get a scouting report. So I'd recommend doing that to get my thoughts on Bradford coming out as at LSU. And then my sub stack, I go into depth with video on Bradford as to why I liked him so much. The game against Jalen Carter last year uh, really stood out. He was able to get after Jalen Carter on a few reps. And if you watch Jalen Carter at all, Georgia, uh, not many guys could do that. And I think that translated right away uh, and throughout the season last year as a rookie for Bradford, just just in terms of what he's able to do physically, in terms of his power is, uh, I think, easily starter caliber. It's just um, pass protection, strike timing, footwork, lining up his target consistently, being in good positions in terms of leverage, like body positioning and things like that, that's the sort of stuff that is very up and down and it leads to some clean glaring losses for him. But I mean, I just think his competitive toughness, his size and his power, uh, I really like, and I think there's something there, uh, in terms of this class, a guy who is very similar to that is Christian Mahogany from Boston college. I mean, these guys are bouncer types, 
you know, brawlers, you know, and they can back it up with their physical traits. And yeah, I mean, that they, they're pretty similar to me. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, I think Bradford, that's kind of the guys that Seattle was like traditionally. I mean, Mike Cupati, Dave Jackson, him, Phil Haynes, you know, the list goes on. These are all the same kind of guy. So uh, yeah, I think Bradford fits right in and Mahogany is kind of similar. All right. Same question with Olu. Olu with Timmy, who was drafted by the Seahawks last year, is in line to potentially be the starter at center this year. Um, where do you think he would fit um, in this year's draft class? Um, I mean, there's a guy coming out of Michigan who's somewhat similar, Jake Drake Nugent. Uh, he's, he's a center prospect. I see Olu with Timmy. Um, you know, could guys people can read my report on him but quick quick overview you know i had a i think fifth round grade on him and uh i just saw more of a kind of a quality backup who could potentially start you know in the short term uh and and that was really stemmed from his lack of size and power you know i see more of a uh he was obviously a highly decorated uh college player um consummate leader consummate teammate uh, that, that sort of thing, you know, that, you know, uh, appeals to a lot of people for a center, uh, but he's a center only. He's not going to play guard. Um, and, you know, that kind of limits his, uh, his, va- his ability to create value for an offensive line. And I just, I just saw him getting reset at the line of scrimmage uh, too much and just kind of conceding ground a little bit too much to translate to, you know, a long-term starter in the NFL. So, um, that's not to say he couldn't start, you know, in the short term and win with intangibles and, you know, toughness and smarts and things like that. But I, I didn't see a, uh, like a long-term answer in center there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, you, you hit on the head on what I've seen. I mean, even watching last year in practice when Evan Brown, who's not necessarily the, the greatest center to live, he's fine, but, uh, he would attack the sled and how it would move versus when Olu Timmy would push the same sled. It was, it was, it was quite different. So, um, uh, if I could steal a couple more questions for you, uh, close out here. Um, I'm curious, uh, Seahawks have a new OC and Ryan Grubb and a new offensive line coach and Scott Huff. I'm wondering if there's anything that you noticed when you've looked at the way Washington played on the offensive line, their type of lineman over the last couple of years that you think will, will be different than what the Seahawks have done on the offensive line, uh, maybe different types of players or different types of, of blocking schemes that could affect who they're, they'd pick. Hey, Brandon, did you hear that question? Sorry, you were cutting out pretty heavy right there. Um, yeah, let me. Am, a, are you hearing me better now? Uh, okay, there you go. Yeah. yeah I, All right, I let's that. try that one more time. It. Quick question was was whether you know watching uh, Scott Huff and and Ryan Grubb at UW the last couple of years, are there different types of linemen or different blocking scheme that they bring to Seattle that might affect the type of players the Seahawks would draft? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I feel like, you know, there's some variance in the NFL with, with scheme. Um, you know, there's, there's some outliers that kind of heavily focus in, you know, whether it's a zone based play action based traditional Shanahan esque sort of system, or, you know, you contrast that. I think probably the, the main contrast to that is, is a multiple, uh, sort of run scheme, which I think the majority of NFL teams run. And I don't see that much of a difference between those sorts of schemes. So, um, yeah, I, I think uh, multiple is probably what you, you're, you're going to be looking at, where it's inside outside zone mixed with pin pull, which is kind of his own scheme, mixed with some gap elements, you know, power, counter, maybe some, you know, offhand, like, you know, some traps mixed in there. Uh, and some teams incorporate those sorts of concepts more than others, but I'd say by and large right now, I mean, it's, it's a multiple run scheme world in the NFL. Uh, you know, even, even Kyle Shanahan in San Francisco now is running a ton of, uh, gap, uh, man sort of principles in the run game as well. You look at what Sean McVay did 
I mean, he's a duo, a duo play caller now. You know, he's downhill vertical uh, base run run game now. He's he's not doing the outside wide zone that he did. Uh, you know, when he first came into the NFL and had all that success. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of just where the NFL is now. I think more than anything, it's it's a multiple sort of world. All right, last question. Hopefully, you can hear me on this one. Uh, we've talked about prospects. You do look at some of the teams as well. You talked about um, Anthony Bradford. Any other comments on the Seahawks, either side of the trench uh, trenches, if you have any, like Abe Lucas, Charles Cross, any thoughts there um, uh, about what you see as potential development there? Yeah, I mean, I still would say that this is a, uh, a really good situation to tackle, assuming, you know, Abe Lucas. And I, you know, I, I don't have any insight as to that not being the case. So assuming that's going to happen, I mean, you know, th these are two, I would say, solid to good well, you know, year or two. Um, so really good situation at tackle. Um, I mean, even Stone Forsyth is, I think, uh, you know, a capable swing, you know, tackle. And, uh, you know, you can always upgrade that. But um, so I think tackle, you know, pretty good. Uh, you know, to, to really good and promising still. I, I don't think those guys are, you know, at their ceiling yet of where they can be by any means. Um, you know, it's really the interior. I think, you know, all three spots are somewhat up in the air. I, I say right guard with Bradford is, you know, the, the spot on the interior that I would feel the best in. Uh, and then left guard and center are really where you're looking to upgrade, specifically left guard to me. I think that's Taliese Fawaga. Uh, who I think reminds me a lot of Mike Upati. I mean, that one makes perfect sense. Uh, Troy Font Fatanu. I think one of those two guys that left guard, man, and you could have something, you know, with this offensive line and, and see if Oluwatimi can, you know, what he could do, you know, as a starter. I think you guys have Nick Harris as well. Um, you know, I think you could probably roll with that if you get kind of like a stud at left guard, you know, and I, I think that that you could probably, there's probably a really good chance of that happening at pick 16. That, folks, is Brandon Thorne uh, kindly joining us while on the road, fitting us between a number of other things that he's got going on. Brandon, thank you so much for coming on here on Hawk Blogger Mornings. Really appreciate it. And uh, we will talk again hopefully here soon. Good luck in all your, your coverage and in uh, everything going forward for you. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you having me. This is fun. All right. Thank you. That was Brandon Thorne. Uh, apologies if the audio was a little bit cutting in and out, um, for folks, uh, <laughs> you've all been in that situation when you're on the road and you know, you're, you're in and out of dead zones. So, uh, this is a good reason and a good reminder why, uh, start on, um, being a patron, patreon.com slash Hawk blogger. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to go in and try to pull up his volume on audio. So it's a little easier to hear. That will go up only for patrons on patreon.com slash hawkblogger. You'll get access to it here in just a few moments after I've made those edits. And you'll be able to hear that hopefully a little bit better. I was able to hear most of what Brandon said. So if you were watching on YouTube and it was a struggle, I appreciate you tuning in. Sorry about that. We do the best we can do. But I'll do just about anything to get a conversation with good evaluators. And I think Brandon is really well respected around the NFL as an evaluator of guys on the trenches. He and I talked about also reviewing some defensive prospects, but he does not really dive into defensive prospects in college as much. Um, so we focused on the offensive line and interesting to me, you know, he really came back to Fuaga and Fatanu a lot, not a surprise. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of Rob Rang was on this morning, Fatanu, like, the clearly the most commonly mocked guy to the Seahawks is Troy Fautanu. And maybe it'll just be that simple. I mean, I don't, I don't think that would be a bad pick for sure. Uh, it was interesting to hear from Brandon about the fact that he sees Olo with Timmy as a backup and he had a fifth round grade. I mean, that is what I have seen. <laughs> that is what I have seen. I think he could be a serviceable starter because I think he can hold up and pass pro. Um, but 
I don't know, man. Like he, he really, uh, when I said to Brandon, watching him block, even just the pushing the blocking uh, sleds, it was noticeably different how much less power he had than some of the other guys going through those drills. And, you know, depending on your body size, it's just hard to change some of those things. So hopefully he's had an off season of putting on some weight and putting on some muscle and maybe he can get a little more functional strength. But I agree. I generally believe that the offensive line has three below average spots, left guard, right guard, and center. I don't think Anthony Bradford has proven he is even an average starting guard in the NFL. It's good to hear that Brandon really liked his tape and believed that he has upside, but also realistically talked about him as, you know, a guy that can be above average. He talked about him being similar to Christian Mahogany. Christian Mahogany, he is a guy that he did not mention as having Pro Bowl upside. He mentioned him as being kind of a mauler. And so I think it is also worth pointing out Christian Mahogany is a guy that John Schneider could get later. And that is maybe the type of guy that he's looking at and saying, ah, yeah, we're going to use our first round pick differently. We're not going to go for guard because I like this guy and I'm pretty sure he's going to be available. I think it was also interesting to hear from him that Zach Zinter, not a guy that he's as high on. Um, you know, that's a guy that certainly Jeff and I have talked about quite a bit as maybe being available later due to injury and being a, uh, you know, a, a pretty good prospect to add to your list. Didn't sound like Brandon was quite as high on him. <clears throat> uh, also, Dominic Pooney talked about him and, and likes him as a prospect. So that might be one to watch. I know he likes Graham Barton. He's got some great stuff that he's done with Graham Barton. And he talked about guys that he sees as Pro Bowl to, to you know, even beyond level upside at the guard position as being Fautanu Fuaga. Barton, um, and, and then maybe Jackson Powers Johnson, if you see him as, as a guard. Um, and it sounds like he's got Barton. He had Barton as his second ranked guard uh, after Fautanu. Basically said Fautanu is a guy that he has above Barton, mainly just because of power, which makes perfect sense. Uh, Fautanu is just a much more physically imposing specimen. I see Barton as more of a mover. Not that Fautanu's stiff, but I think Barton is a little bit more athletic in that way and could get you on some pulls and pins and stuff like that. So I agree with him that that those two guys, to me, stand out head and shoulders above a lot of these other guys um, in terms of upside. And so if that means you could get a Barton in the mid-20s and get a second-round pick to do it, I still think that is the probably best-case scenario for the Seahawks as it currently stands. Um, so really good to get some, some information from Mr. Brandon Thorne. I see some, uh, questions and comments from members. So I will give those a quick look. Uh, Maddie B says that might be the first positive thing he's heard about stone Forsyth. LOL. I'm with you there. I certainly think Stone Forsyth is Forsyth is not a guy I'd be sending roses to. Uh, Joey Walker lets us know that he sounded clear on YouTube when he had clear service. So that's good to know. Um, Michael Fawcett says, I'd love to double down on interior off of the line after hearing this. Yeah. I mean, this is something that Brandon said. He said, this is an excellent draft for offensive line, interior offensive line, <clears throat> especially when you're looking at center as well. So, uh, yeah, agreed. I don't think that would be a bad idea at all. Eric Kinnaman uh, says, does that make a stronger case for Barton out of Duke in a trade back? Yeah. And Eric's th thinking along with me. Uh, I do. I do think that that makes a really good case. And it just depends on what is available. They got to find a willing trade partner and, and have that conversation and, and then get the right pick in return. If they move down to 25 to get Barton and then only pick up a third round pick, I don't know that that's sufficient um, to, to make that leap. I'd almost rather just have the better guard, the better prospect, or, or get the better player at 16 than just pick up another third-round pick. But that might be the type of thing that, that the Seahawks have to think about, and uh, that'll be tough. If you get a second-round pick, I think it's a lot easier of a decision. All right, folks, that is the second episode well not full episode but bonus episode of hawk blogger mornings uh, on this friday morning april 5th 
I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Rob Rang this morning. It is already up for patrons on patreon.com slash hawkblogger. I also made that particular episode available for anyone that subscribes to Real Hawk Talk on any of your podcast platforms. So you can get it on Apple Podcasts, anywhere where you listen, you know, Spotify, uh, look up Real Hawk Talk and you will get the audio version there. So even if you are a YouTube only member and you want to get a feel for what the audio versions sound like and why that's great to have access to the audio version, this is a good chance to get a feel, test drive it um, on the Real Hawk Talk feed um, for free. And then if you love it, which I hope you will, uh, go to patreon.com slash hawkblogger, get immediate access there to all of the audio versions of this podcast, as well as the Slack channel and a bunch of other good things. So Please support the show. Give it a like, click subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow. Time TBD. Uh, we'll see. It's probably going to be a little bit later in the morning, um, and it's probably going to just be me. I will be talking uh, Seahawks and talking about news there. So hopefully I will see you there. If not, have a great weekend. Don't forget, Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock p.m. Pacific, the first of the hawk blogger morning draft round tables with griffin sturgeon at c mike spin move and rob staten uh really really looking forward to that jeff simmons will join as well so a full crew to talk about the comings and goings on the nfl draft we will try to do that every week from here until the draft and uh really appreciate you guys supporting the show tune in for that all right take care have a great one i'm brian this has been another episode of hawk blogger mornings